So good afternoon, October the 6th, 2014. This is CISG 114, Section 1, Web Technology and Live. Today is day number 13 in week number 7. So let's get started. Welcome back and good afternoon to this class, CISG 114, Section 1. Now, this is the last week in the second learning contract. So by the end of this week, as you can see, the submission links to this learning contract are already up and waiting for your submissions. So um, the last day to submit something is this Sunday, okay, 11.55. It starts early this morning. So you have one week's time to get things wrap up and done as well as what we expect. So if you look at the teacher's message from this week, okay, so you can see that I've given you the reminder of the six items to be submitted through the submission names. The seventh item is different because you do not need to submit the seventh item, but you have to leave working records there as a whole team. So you do not need to submit this week to work, but what you need to do as a whole team, you need to start working together in the wiki, which is a working space for all of you. And particularly speaking, we would like to see your team building minutes there. We would like to see your uh, two topics, one proposed by each pair there, uh, the discussions details, the OIA from individual pair and from individual students, as well as the report, which is very important, each team two topics, just like in the first learning contract. So, Having said that, the second thing you need to know, that's of today, is you need to know how to use the wiki. Now, how can you use the wiki? If you look at the, the tools provided, that's of week number six, we have one specific tool called Team Online Discussion Forum that means all the four members of your team can come here and do the discussions on the phone. And then this is the wiki. The wiki is for all of you in your team to work together. And what we are going to do today is to show you how to use the wiki, okay, after the brief introductions today. So, first of all, if you come to the wiki here, this is the wiki for this learning contract. You can see that you will read a page like this, which tells you, do you want to create a page? When you click on this button, you can start creating the page. And then you must check this HTML format. Our format, it's also working, but this is the test. Okay, now I'm doing this for all of you. So the way we use a wiki is very simple, but you need to learn one trick. The trick to create a page is to come here, click this, okay, then you will be given a front page. So let's come here. So this is the wiki for all the words here. So if I belong to a specific team, let's say I belong to a team called XX, okay? So if this is a specific team, I type in the team's titles here. So I do have some team members. So I would have two pairs, okay? So maybe the first pair is M. Okay, so the second pair is M. Okay, so you have your team names here, you have the first pair and the second pair. So say in the first pair I have two members, John and then Billy. Second pair, I have two members, Mary and Joseph Free. Okay, so I've got some basic information recorded here. Now, perhaps I want to get accessible some artifacts. So you have the first one. This could be John's 
today, I just want to make sure that I'm using the same name in order not to confuse the individual pages. Okay? So Using the same name is very important. Okay, so from this, you can also have um, discussions for other names which is much descriptive but I'm trying to use this as the basis of my example so for example I have set up my front page to include the following important information maybe I also would like to get So when I use, start using the wiki, I'm presented with this text editor, I type something in, so I'm going to save this now. So here we are, we are transferred to this proper page for the wiki in the middle and bottom. You can see that we have two important buttons. First, I just wrote what I typed in using the text editor. Now I want to change something here. I need to select edit. Okay? Just from the wiki video, you know that we have two important buttons. So I would like to edit this basic front page. So in a sense, I would like to create pages. So if this is my front page, I want to get into the team space. I want to get into this pair space or this pair space, or I want to get into the individual space for John, individual space for Billy, Mary, or Josephine. So what I have to do is I need to put a set of double square bracket in closing the name. So I have the first set of square bracket and not a set of square bracket in close this name. So I'm going to do the same for the hair name. I, I must tell you that this is the only trick you need to learn, okay, in order to create the pages. So suppose I have improved, would like to have three separate pages or we call spaces. This is the team space. This is the pair MM space. This is the pair NN space. So I would like also to include the individual space of Josephine. So you can see that I'm creating the square brackets. So after that, I've saved them. So now when you look at the saved versions of this wiki, you can see that all in a sudden, the black ink letters turn red. Now, those red symbols represent the links of form, and the system is ready to create the first page, the second page, the third page, and the fourth page immediately under this front page. Okay? So, you can now start creating the team space, but in, a, in order to show you how best to create a team space, I'm going to create, I'm going to copy this, okay? And then in order to create the team space, I'm going to click on this name. So when I click on this name, you will be presented once again this page asking you if you would like to create a page under the 
the system with this specific name of this page, again with this format, and you say yes by clicking on this link. And once you have to click on this link, you will brought into another text editor where you can say this is our team space. Okay, and then you paste the material you earlier copied into this particular team space, and perhaps you can also add something here now. You want to take a look at John's journal. Okay, you want to take a look at Billy's journal. So I'm going to save this now. So once I've saved this, you can see that John's journal and these journals have here read. That means these are links to be formed as the two pages immediately under this page called the CISG 114 section 1 team XX. So in the system of pages that you have just seen creating, you have the front page, you have four different pages, okay, and this is one of the four pages in the second level, and two more pages on the first level, okay? So now you can continue to click on John's journal. If I with John, I will enter my space and put here my online learning journal for the reference of the whole team. Because each member in your team is able to walk into this and take a look at the spaces. Okay? So by doing something like this, you can gather together all the members of your team into this workspace, okay, and then start doing things together. But the most important thing is you must have the team meetings with it and everybody knows he's on a role and do what? Okay? But by creating spaces for the teams, for the pair, and for individual spaces where you know where you should go, okay? And when you reach there, you put things there which make sense for this particular title, right? So it will be the efforts together to create the artifacts and working together by looking into your pair members' work or the work of the individual team members. Now the next question that you have to ask is how can I get back to the front page or to the other page in the second or third level? So the, the, the method is very simple. If you look at the, the tabs here, there's one tab called map, okay? You go to the map tab where you can see a number of links here. Now in this particular case, we have just created this is the front page, and this is the first page immediately under the front page. We have not created the other pages yet. So what I need to do is I create a link to the front page. So I just copy this. Once I copy this, I get back to this particular page. Now, by clicking this link, I am able to get back to this page, and then in order to add a home link here, I do edit. Okay? In the under the edit functions, you will be able to do editing with the text editor, and then you have to do something here, okay, and that is called adding a link. I just copy and paste this link here, and this is supposed to be the home link. So a web find home. Alright? So after that I say save. Now you can see this page again. When you click on this particular link, you will be brought to the front page. This is the front page. In other words, you have the means to create different spaces for the work to be somewhere. And such spaces will be responsible by the members of this pair, members of this pair, and this is responsible by individual member of the team. So use your imaginations 
and see what kind of workspace design you want that could best represent your work. And basically, you need to sew your artifact items at the very beginning or step by step into the next pages. So do you understand how to make it work for you? Now remember, such workspace is very much boundary by your team. You cannot enter the wiki space of another team except for your own team's wiki space, okay? And once you enter, the wiki space of your own team seems each member of your team is able to walk in here and do whatever changes in such spaces, you must have some ground rules to maintain such that any member is not supposed to change or delete anything from a space which is not his or area. For example, John's journal should not be tempered by anyone here, okay, because these are John's work. They could add in some content, but they are not supposed to delete something like this. In the past, students do not know that this is the rule they have to observe. And many students' work are being changed by their friends without a notice. And you have to create some rules to make sure you follow the rules to collaborate. Okay? So, this is the end of my introductions here. What you need to do is you need to go back to this particular wiki space, okay? To select your own wiki space, all right? How do you select? First of all, in your uh, wiki space, each one of you is going to see three items. The first is your own name, wiki space. The second is the wiki space of your hair. Finally, it will be the wiki space of your team. Now, make sure when you are here, select the wiki space of your own team. Do not select your own name, wiki space, because that no one can see that for you. Do not select the peer space, because only your friend, your, uh, your peer member, can see that. But you want the whole team to see the work, so you need to select the teams, okay? So that is a very important trick. And I've given you not just the team wiki, I've also given you here, if you look at it very carefully, um, week number six, It's your pair wiki true. Now, this wiki, this pair wiki, even though it's indicated by the name of the pair, it's different from the pair wiki you see here. Because the model system will always give you a new wiki when we create new wikis from here. So, if you ever want to use this pair wiki, use it within your pair. But remember, what you wrote here, you cannot see from the pair wiki, which is visible from this link, because they are two different wiki. Select only the team wiki here, select only the pair wiki here, okay? So that, if you can stick to this rule, you will not confuse yourself, all right? So that is very important. Remember the keyword team here, remember the keyword pair here. Virtually, your work should be indicated in this wiki because based on the requirement of the second wedding contract. This is just a sketch, okay? So you do not produce anything here for uh, my uh, inspections to produce it right here for my inspection, all right? I'm going to take a look at it from here. I do not expect to see anything here, right here, all right? But you, you can use it for your sketch purposes. So having said that, allow me to go back to this week. So this week, we are going to continue with the theme of self-regulated learning, which is the last week for the second learning contract. Now, self-regulated learning is built on top of inquiry-based learning. So as I did in week number four for the first learning contract, this is the last week for the second learning contract, I will show you something to put things into perspective. And the something that I'm going to show you is for student-centered teaching, all right? So what we are doing in this first and the second learning contract under the name of inquiry-based learning and now under the name of self-regulated learning 
it's done under the big umbrella for the student set of EG. So we are going to help you to put things into perspective, particularly speaking when you're doing it under the teamwork context. So let's try here. That's because I did not. I did not get to the link to That's okay. Right here. This particular video, it's available. Um, during the class link, I'm going to show it to you. Hi, this is Paul from Petri Education. Today's video is about student-centered learning. Like many aspects of 21st century learning, student-centered learning is fairly misunderstood. To judge whether a class is student-centered, you first and foremost have to ask yourself who's doing all the work in the classroom, the teacher or the student? If it's the teacher, then the class is teacher-centered. While the content of the class is extremely important to student-centered learning in that if the content is relevant to the students' lives, that makes it student-centered. The problem is, if it's all about the teacher doing all the talking and basically imposing ideas upon the students, then it's definitely not student-centered learning. In fact, in a student-centered classroom, the teacher has very little airtime. How many teachers out there have you seen that basically feed off their students, hang on and listen attentively to their every word? While it's fantastic for students to admire their teachers, ultimately, student-centered learning is about the students doing all of the work. After all, learning is about doing. So in order for your students to learn, they have to be doing the work, not the teacher. We need to get away from this teacher telling the kids just how things are, or imposing their views upon the students, and allowing the students to at least have the freedom to discover things for themselves. In a nutshell, Project-based learning is the best way to implement student-centered learning because the students are in control of the project. And I'm going to come back to that later on. But firstly, just to kind of indicate, what are the signs of a teacher-centered class? Well, as I've said, in a teacher-centered class, the teacher's doing all of the work. They're doing all of the talking. Even if the students say something, the teacher will frequently interrupt the student or finish what they're saying, or perhaps even correct their point of view and actually point out where that student's wrong because those views conflict with the teacher's own. The teacher may give good marks on papers where the students are agreeing with what the teacher believes, and bad marks the students have an opposing view to the teacher, regardless of the quality of the writing. Ultimately, it's quite hard to avoid teacher-centered classes, because it's human nature to teach what you believe to be important. And as a result, classes are highly politicized, they will contain information that essentially imposes views upon the students about what is right and what is wrong, what is important, what's not important. And so you, you can't sanitize a class, you can't eliminate that because everything is politicized. But at the same time, you can't be a hypocrite, you can't ask your students to be open-minded when you yourself are highly judgmental. You have to give room in your class for students to have views that oppose yours. So if students are doing all of the work and they're working in groups on projects, what are the things that they could be carrying out that they wouldn't ordinarily in a teacher's end of class? Well, firstly, there's clearly more student talking time. The, the communication process is highly complex because they're working in pairs, they're working in groups, they're communicating verbally and in written form. They give presentations, so there's a public speaking element of the class. They're doing peer teaching or even teaching a whole class they have to defend an opinion because that opinion is going to differ from other people. They may have to negotiate because they're working in groups and when you're coming up with a group idea, you have to be able to make compromises and also defend your position where you believe so strongly that something should be included or things should be done a certain way. There's a huge element of researching involved rather than the teacher presenting you with all the facts. You have to be the one that goes out and finds those facts. Then you have to sort through them, use critical thinking to decide what facts are accurate, which facts are inaccurate or biased. You have to be able to amalgamate that data. You have to be able to form informed opinions based on the data that you've found. All of the researching, communicating online, and using computers for presentations and for your papers, these are developing computer skills that perhaps you wouldn't ordinarily have had so much use for. There's clearly a huge amount of teamwork involved when you're working on group projects. There's problem solving, there's organization and planning involved. You don't just go ahead and do the project. You have to essentially organize your team, who's going to play what role, and also what are the stages of the project that you're going to go through and what are the timings for those projects. So there's time management involved as well. 
I mentioned on a previous video about student collaboration, how in, for example, lit circle classes, students play different roles. And this is no different from any classroom. It just, the roles may change somewhat depending on what the content of the class is. So in a lit circle class, you can have things like character captains and culture connectors, where that wouldn't be very relevant in other classes. So essentially you have these roles that may be set roles that the teacher has already created, or the students may just invent roles themselves based on the need of the group. The greatest thing about student-centered learning is that students have the chance to learn by doing. And, more than this, they have the chance to learn by making mistakes. They're not given facts. They're not being told, this is how it is, now write about that. They basically have to go out there and find out for themselves. They have to create projects that may ultimately be failures but they learn by going through that process. They learn by making mistakes in their groups on how not to work in a team and then find out, well, you know, we shouldn't have done that. You have to go through that kind of evaluation process or self-evaluation at the end of every project. Now, of course, we can't escape the fact that the teacher's are in the room. The teacher's role, as I mentioned on other videos, is there to act as a mentor. There is obviously instructional work that needs to be done by a teacher. It just shouldn't take up entire classes for week upon week. The teacher's there essentially to present the minimal information just to get the students to understand something and then get them working, get them doing something. And so much of what teachers do at the moment in the classroom could be done by the students. It's just that the teachers just can't let go of control. They feel like they have to be constantly at the front of the class. Even when the students are at the front of the class, the teacher's up there with them. Why? The teacher shouldn't be anywhere near them because essentially they're sharing the limelight that the students should be receiving. It's almost like the students don't belong at the front of the class, that's the teacher's position, which is complete nonsense. In my classes, I make a point of actually sitting down with the rest of the students while the other students are up there presenting, because I'm not more important than the students are. If someone's up in the front of the class, I'm just going to sit down with the rest of my students, and that's where I belong, because I'm a member of the audience. Our jobs as teachers are to observe our students, watch how they interact watch how they carry out research, watch how they organize and plan their projects, how they organize their teams, and look for weaknesses in those things. Look for strengths in members of the team who are able to carry out those things of so basically delegating to people, leading the group, and also bringing out the best in others, and then point that out to them and the rest of the students that that person has that ability, but then teach the other students how to do that, or better still, get the person that's good at it to teach their peers. Now, coming from a British background myself, I know how begrudged other students would be by this right now. The idea that someone from their peer group has the nerve to tell them how to do things. But this is the thing of our culture that we have to change. We have to be able to let go of our pride and to be able to accept the abilities of other people in order to learn, in order, in order to better ourselves. We're all too ready to look up to adults and adore them and essentially worship the ground they walk on and listen to their every word as if it's God's law. But then our classmates may say something actually more accurate than the teacher does and we just dismiss their point of view because we don't believe that they can be any better than we can. I've seen this time and again in ESL classes where people younger than them or of the same age or of a different gender and they'll just dismiss what they have to say. I'll ask them to work with that person and they'll just look at me and just carry on working independently because they have no respect for their peers. And this is the thing I'm working on, I'm just thinking to myself, well, I don't care how good your work is, if you're incapable of working with another human being, that's the thing that's going to affect you in life. And that's the thing I'm going to be working on. I may be here to teach you a subject, but that's not all I'm here for. I'm here to teach you life skills. I'm here to teach you social skills. I'm here to teach you how to be successful in life. And it certainly isn't about being independent or being disrespectful to other people. Student-centered learning is by no means a new topic. It's been around for decades, just this whole concept. And yet, when you look at the average classroom, this is just not taking place, mostly because of the way the curriculum is designed, but also just because teachers were educated in a teacher-centered classroom, and this just perpetuates the problem that you end up teaching exactly like you were taught. At some point, this has to change. Some teachers that are currently teacher-centered have to reflect on this and just let go of control. They have to give control over to the students, give them the airtime, set them challenges at the beginning of the class and just let them get on with it. Don't interfere, apart from when things are absolutely out of control, but a little bit of chaos in the classroom is actually a good thing. 
A lot can be learned from making those mistakes, from arguments, from people disagreeing with each other, from people just blatantly making mistakes, because going about things the wrong way. They will learn from making those mistakes. And if they don't, after they've finished, then you can get them to reflect on that and then perhaps guide them on that. That's your job as a teacher, to be a mentor. To finish, I'd like to give you an example of a really bad class, one that is extremely student-centered. After 10 or 20 minutes of explaining the topic and giving multiple examples, she finally said, Okay guys, now try this example. See how you get on. Five seconds pass. Okay, here's the answer. Now don't look if you don't want to see how it's done. If you haven't finished, you can just look away. But let me explain how it's done. It's done like this. Blah, 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 blah. Okay, here's another example. Try this one. Five seconds pass. Okay, here's the answer. Oh, let me explain to you how it's done. Um, if you haven't finished, don't listen, but I'm going to explain to you. The teacher just can't contain herself. She cannot possibly stay quiet for more than five seconds without needing to basically explain to the class the answer. In such a learning environment, there is no learning going on because the teacher is doing all of the work, has all of the airtime, and the students don't even have the opportunity to try. Can you imagine how infuriating it is for the student not to be given the chance to even try to answer the question? They're not given the opportunity to work together, so there's no collaboration going on at all. And worse than that, even if they had the right answer, they're not allowed to come up to the board and actually give the answer and then explain how it's done. Every single answer is done by the teacher, which is just ludicrous. There is no learning there. So to wrap up, I'd like to leave you with this last in thought. The teacher may be able to teach great, but he or she isn't a great teacher. That's all for today's video. If you've enjoyed the video, I really appreciate a rating, and if you haven't already done so, you can subscribe above. The next video about, video about 21st century learning that I'll be doing is about creativity, and so uh, you're going to hear a lot of references to Ken Robinson. This is Paul from Petri Education. Thanks for watching. Okay, uh, I hope you like this particular video. So, um, to put things into perspective, I hope you understand that this is the second learning contract. We study next week, we're getting into the non-study contract, which will help you to understand more about the PBL. We talk about the project-based learning, but in the context of our, of our contract, it is called problem-based learning. So, the difference between problem-based learning and project-based learning sometimes is in project-based learning, we very much concentrate on the product. In a problem-based learning, we very much concentrate on the process of getting things done. We may not be able to have a product, but in this course, when you look at the uh, expected uh, uh, products of your learning contract, it's just a number of artifacts, okay? The number of artifacts which include report, which include discussions more in detail, which include your journals, um, and then your blog. These could always be done uh, with your experience. So, allow me to take attendance first. I forgot to take attendance often because of the time limit. Okay, now, uh, Eva, thank you. Priscilla, thank you. Jackson, uh, thank you. Ken, thank you. Uh, Jackie, thank you. Juan uh, thank you. Isabel, thank you. Uh, Eric.
kids, kids, not yet today, good pets, good pets, thank you. Uh, Kaya, Saikai, not yet today, and Jeff, 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 thank you, Cindy, thank you. And this is Tony, thank you. Miko, Let's get back to the class of today, and I try to reserve some time for you to ask questions towards the end of today's class. Now we are supposed to help you understand something about the virtual office uh, last week, but since we have a holiday, uh, we can get back to the virtual office, our uh, flash shots. So what is supposed to be the virtual office? So the opposite of a virtual office is a physical office. So if I do not have a physical office, I just have a virtual office, can you still come to see me? Sure, but not physically, but through some kind of medium. So let's take a look at the idea of a virtual office. And the advantages of a virtual office, why do we need that? <laughs> some of the reasons why you need a virtual office. Save money. Save money, yes. But why do you need a virtual office at the very beginning? Long way. 
who needs a virtual office? Or who needs a physical office? Any idea? So what do you do with an office? You have an office to, to meet people for some purposes. You have an office to pick up important mails, receive some documents, to make business news, to meet professional people. But when you read the reasons they produce for having a virtual office, it says these are sufficient reasons that you can buy, that you can accept in order to set up your virtual office. Now this is an app, remember, the company called the, the App Advantage, something like this, is April to give you this services. Okay? Now let's take a look at another video. virtual office is the perfect solution for your business. What an excellent choice. Now, you may be asking, how exactly does the process work? And in what ways do I benefit starting right now? Here's how it works. A. Get your personal address. The moment your business begins using an office address, one with reception, office rooms, and personalized interaction, credibility shoots through the roof. There is absolutely nothing worse than handling everything business related via your home, personal cell phone, and coffee shop meetings. B. Live reception. This is far more valuable than meets the eye for reasons previously explained. A personalized receptionist focused on your business who answers every inquiry under your business name is essential. No longer must you question the number calling, forget an important address or meeting, or let unprepared moments ruin chances of closing a prospect. Business should be handled at your convenience, and a personal receptionist offers just that and more. C. Get results. That's right. When incorporating the above principles into your business, functionality and overall results will surely follow. These services offer incredible savings in time, money, and convenience. As a business owner, nothing is more beneficial than those luxuries. Your credibility will increase, stress will drop, and customer interaction becomes a primary focus. Could it get any better, and for such an incredible rate? Fact is, you are losing money right now by not employing a virtual office. Your business is not achieving its full potential. And for what reason? You have a turnkey solution at your fingertips, with the potential to launch revenue to entirely new levels. How many possibilities are truly available for under $150 per month? Think about an office that functions to the same capacity costs a minimum of $3,500 per month to maintain. And that's a bottom dollar statistic without amenities. Call now 1-888-456-3342 to request a customized quote and begin reaping the benefits of United Virtual Office. A new era of business has arrived. 1-888-456-3342. We forgot about the app, but we can see that it's another company doing the business of offering you the convenience of virtual office. And so, if I ask you this question, who is this advertisement for? You and I? Do you have any idea who will use such services? You want to set up your own business? Do you need a physical ad 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 office to start with? What do you need? The virtual office, it saves, is it very good? But what if you need some phrase to meet with people? A virtual office does not help. So, what do you think? Now, we got some ideas, okay? We start with the needs, okay? And we know some good things about a virtual office. It can save a lot of money. But does it solve all the problems? Not all. It can solve all the problems. At least, you can ask the questions. Now, I have some very interesting video here. You can actually call for a virtual secretary 
put it over in your virtual office and answer your call all 24 hours a day. And this is a very interesting example of the NISA version 1.0. Now, um, let me, I'll let you enjoy this at home. But the point here is, let's see. I think this is very interesting. All the risk and all the purchase rule. But uh, let you see the meanings of the Intelligent Office provides the choice of a traditional office and staff to working virtually, intelligently, and everything in between. So if you're looking for full-time space, well, come on in. You're not going to rent an office you haven't seen, and they do come in different sizes and shapes. But while you're here, you might want to learn about another way to have an office and staff a la carte that not only works better, but costs a whole lot less. We saved a huge amount of overhead uh, costs from when we had our own had to pay for our own physical location, and, and yet we're much more productive than we used to be. Intelligent Office allows businesses to have the benefits of working virtually while doing it intelligently. With Intelligent Office, my shop is open every single hour uh, of the business week, whether I'm here or not. And because of the technology that Intelligent Office employs, I can be a thousand miles away on a business trip. And my clients would never know the difference. I'm, I'm able to take a call immediately as it comes in through cell phone forwarding that Intelligent Office offers. And it's, it's tremendously flexible and allows me to, if I'm not in the office, still address client concerns. Work is now something you do. It's no longer a place. But sometimes you need a professional office to send the message you're serious about your business. Intelligent Office provides that professional office space and trained intelligent assistants, on demand all day. But you only pay for what you use, and use only what you need. Ask yourself this, how many hours last week did your clients want to meet face-to-face -face at your office? For most of us, that's maybe an hour, or a few. We mostly go to our customer's place of business. So why pay rent 24-7 when you only really need professional space occasionally? With Intelligent Office, now you can work from anywhere. Intelligent Office provides gorgeous offices and conference rooms, even workstations, on an hourly basis, whenever you need them. This is your office, in a prestigious building. Your name is in the lobby and on the suite directory. This is the professional address of your office. It's where your mail is delivered and put in a locked private mailbox, available to you 24-7. It's where your packages are delivered and signed for, safe for you to pick up at your convenience. It's where your customers or your staff can drop things off and pick them up all day, every day, at your office. And every time your customers come and go, you're sending the message of professionalism and credibility. Intelligent Office is your office. It just works better and costs a lot less. And when you're a member in one, you're a member in all. You can arrange for branch office and address services, even a local telephone number and receptionist, in any of our offices throughout North America. Choose the intelligent office near you to discover more ways to grow your business, intelligently, at a fraction of the usual cost. Intelligent office, the benefits of working virtually while doing it intelligently. So do you see the differences between the services offered by this company and the two previous ads? Okay, what are the major distinctions? Now, I'm not going to ask you for the immediate answers. I've just given you all the information that you can start to sort your things out. Now, the next things I would like you to know is, suppose you really have an office, be it a physical office or a virtual office. What do you think is the most important equipment in that office? What do you think is the most important thing in that office? Do you need... What, what do you think is the most important thing in your office? A computer? What else? An iPhone? Or... What? Now, 
something that we need every day. We cannot live without it. Just take a look at your pocket. You have a mobile phone. What does it mean? What does it mean? You have a number that people can use to reach you, right? You have a means, just like an email address people can use to reach you. Can you imagine? I have a number, people can reach me, but if I were not there, they can record a message, and a message, well definitely, people can record a message and they can, they can listen to the message later. But what if the message could be transcribed as an email and sent to your email account to remind you, please read your email. And when you log in to your email account, the, the message box there is breaking. You have a voice message just transcribed as an email message for you. Do you do we have this this service provided by CTF in the cloud? Do we have this service? Yes or no? Do we need to pay for this service? Or such service available? Okay. So what if the other way around? Someone sent you an email in your email, whenever you receive an email, okay, normally will get a beep from our mobile phone whenever if we set it that way. Okay? So if you receive thousand email a day, you still have a beep, 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 which tells you you have a lot of incoming messages. Okay? This is possible. But what if you can do something like this? Whenever you receive a, a text message, the text message could be read by a specific service and sent as a voice message to your phone and so you can listen to the voice message directly. Is this important for virtual office? Do we have something like this? Can we enjoy the free of charge? Let me see if I could show you this. Hello, my name is Michael Molina and I'm the product marketing manager for Google Voice. What is Google Voice? So Google Voice is uh, essentially a way to get a phone number from Google. It's all about connectivity. It's about helping people stay in touch with each other, getting more out of your existing services, and providing this you know. It takes a while. I, I got this from this morning to create product and free experience to people uh, in a way that will benefit them. You have a number with Google, yes. and people can call that phone number, yes. and you have to get a Google phone? What does it work? Oh, no, you don't need to get a Google phone. You keep your same exact phone. You don't have to switch numbers or get rid of numbers. You don't have to worry about changing service plan. Your phone plan and your phone number will stay the same. Think of Google Voice as a layer on top of your number, as a layer that comes with a lot of features that make your number more powerful. For example, this phone number can then ring all of the other phones that you may have. So say, you know, assuming you have a mobile phone, a home line and an office phone, your Google number, when it's called by anybody, will bring all of those phones, or just two of them, which really up to you to decide what you want to have them. So now looking at smaller users, sure. um, how would a business use this you know, in daily comparison to a 1-800 number, why wouldn't they just use the regular sure. landlines? Um, Google Voice is free, and on top of it being free, you can make free calls to the United States and to Canada. On top of that, you can send free text messages. And if you're calling internationally, if you're doing business internationally, we have some of the lowest rates around. And you can make those calls when you're logged into Google Voice from our mobile app uh, or from Gmail. Another really interesting way that you could use it would be having custom voicemail greetings based on who's calling you. So I know this company, NFC of New York and Plattsburgh, and a lot of their customers speak French because they're from Montreal. And so they've set up two different voicemail greetings, one for people that are calling them, their clients in Montreal, that has a French message, and then they have a second uh, voicemail greeting in English for people who are calling them from Goros. On top of that, some of the really cool things are uh, voicemail transcriptions. So with voicemail transcriptions, my voicemails get transferred into text, and then they get sent to me via text message. I also know this real estate agent from New York, and uh, she's always on the go in her car. She's my mother. <laughs> and so say she's in the car with a client and she has another client that has a closing that day and she gets a voicemail from that client. She doesn't have to pick up her phone and listen to the voicemail. She can actually just read a transcription of it as a text message when she has time with that client and get back to her other client if it's very urgent. What else? Uh, is there more? Yeah, of course. There, of there course. are lots more. Okay, lots of more. All right, when you're logged into Google Voice, it looks just like
for each email, right? So you have an inbox, and from this inbox, you can make phone calls right there. You can send free text messages, also right there. Uh, it stores all of your text messages so that you can read them like email threads and respond to them in line. Where does that click into in Google Talk to be able to call people and uh, out of Gmail and stuff? You can make phone calls from Gmail from your Google Voice number. Okay. And you can also receive calls in Gmail. And so the way that works if you get a call to your Gmail account is that you'll hear a ring, just like the phone will ring, and a little menu will pop up. You click the accept button, and then as long as you've got your microphone hooked up, you can start having a conversation right away. Okay. You can also bring up a dial pad and make calls locally, internationally, wherever you want. Is it one phone number for the rest of your life? Yeah, it's a phone number that you will never have to change, really. I did not know you could do that. You can. That is very cool. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, you got it. You want to try? Well, just sign up. Okay. <laughs> All right. Now we have uh, students who would like to share today. Let me welcome Sophie. And um, do we have you, you have a partner together with you? Okay, and Cindy. So let me pass the time to you. Uh, unfortunately, the microphone does not seem to work today, so you need to speak up. Thank you very much. Is the public online discussion form? Yeah. Right. Just click into it. Yes. Scroll down. Yeah. Today we're going to share something about podcast. So with podcast, you can find a huge variety of new and interesting content from the internet to, to fill your MP3 player for free. You can listen to what you want, when you want, and how you want. Imagine getting new radio style talk and music shows to listen to on your iPod or other MP3 player every day. You wake up and automatically have have new shows ready to listen to while you, while you exercise or commute to work. This is a podcast listening experience. Not only that, but every, anyone can create his or her own radio style show and podcast it to the world in very little time and at very little cost. And you, need, and you only need a computer, a mic, and the internet. When I first heard about podcasting, I was blown away. I spent a week reading everything I could about podcasts and finding new podcasts to listen to. I was so excited about the idea of so much great, original and interesting content to listen to. I could also, I could also sense that this was going to be an amazing new way to share content across the internet and to millions, millions of MP3 players. I guess everyone has used podcasts, uh, so I had my time to. Blogs have been around us for a while. What sets podcasts apart is that they can be automatically downloaded to your computer and sent to your MP3 player without you leaving a finger. You can wake up each morning with new shows on your MP3 player ready to listen on your way to work. It's as and the convenience of this automatic delivery is powerful. This is what sets podcasts apart so popular. Imagine walking into Starbucks to get a drink and by the time you leave 
who have new shows to listen in on your MP3 player. We haven't reached that point yet. Thank you, thank you for Sydney and Sylvie for the podcast story. We'd love to hear more stories of this kind. Um, now let's get back to our class briefly because we are supposed to end it right now in less than four minutes. Uh, I just got the video produced, it's been uploaded to YouTube for last week. So just wait until tonight. So, now let me come back to yes. It takes a while for the client boss to come back again. Okay. Now uh, allow me to stop right here and may I ask you do you have any questions for your second learning contract? Have you ever had meetings with all the members in the team here? Okay, remember the last day to submit your artifact is this Sunday at 11.55, okay? And the questionnaire for the secondary contract will be up this Saturday and not for four days this time. So, if you do have any questions, I'm going to end my class today here. We'll come back to talk about mashups and tagging on first day. Okay, so that's it for today, CISG 114, Section 1, Web Technology and Light, on day number 13, week number 7. Until next time, this coming Thursday, stay in tune.